were thought that the British were responsible for all the base corruption in India and everything else. Yeah. If, if you read history, that's not the truth because the Rajas were so corrupt. In fact, Jahangir, the man who so, the Raja who sold uh, India to the British, was an opium addict, an alcoholic, uh, a corrupt guy, and so it went down the line. So basically, what the book says, partly, is that the British, of course, the, 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 you know, they were corrupt, but the British came in and built on the foundations of this corruptness in India. They, yeah. didn't, they didn't create it, you know, and nobody can dispute that because history says that. Uh, so that's partly what the book is. But what the book really states is this. This is what the book is about. It's, uh, it's about a guy called Charlie Strongbow an Englishman who was born in Bombay, has never seen England. Uh, the day after independence, a week or so after that, they decide to, to, to run a, a, a black market operation between Southampton and Bombay. <coughs> the goods were stored in a place called Cross Island in Bombay that's very close to the docks. Uh, that's how it started. Uh, it's a fictional book. It's historical fiction. But I, I had heard this story when I was visiting England in Croydon. And I read some of his letters, of the, the letters. So I decided to write this novel. So basically, the novel works on, on two levels. One is the, the India corruption level. And one is how Charlie Strongbow could function. Because, you know, the, the society was so corrupt. He just bribed his way through. Uh, I, I was helped uh, by somebody who worked at the Bombay docks for 31 years, and I mentioned it in the novel, where he detailed the modus operandi of how smuggling was done in the docks. The docks, uh, you know, huge corrupt place, probably to still today, because, you know, all these guys steal merchandise, sell it in the black market. Uh, so, so basically, that's what the book is about, and uh, right. we'll see how it goes. It's being published by Speaking Tiger in New Delhi. Uh, it should hit the stands by the 12th of November in India, and also be available worldwide on Amazon and uh, and eBooks. Uh, Godfrey, Godfrey, so but to start, to start to start at the beginning, uh, with me this evening is Godfrey Pereira. Uh, an author from Bandra and Mumbai and much more. You'll get to know as we go by. And Godfrey is the author of the novel Bloodline Bandra. And now 4 and 20 Blackbirds. Okay. Uh, Godfrey, would you like to give us an update about both your novels, past and present? Yeah, just a minute, okay? I'm, I'm going to plug in this phone because I don't want it to die on me. Hold on a minute because I, oh, it's here. I just want to plug the phone in. Right, right. Take your time, take your time. So, so yeah, while Godfrey is plugging in the phone, I'll tell you this other story of how we got connected. That's quite a funny story, which is a chapter in itself. Godfrey, if you could just uh, turn the phone on to horizontal so we can see more of you. So we can see more of you in the, in the. In oh, the... yeah, okay. So tell us about your novels. We'll come back to your story later. That's funny in itself, but. You okay. know, uh, yeah. So, 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 tell us about your novel. You're talking about which novel, Bloodline Bandra, or Four starting, and starting with Bloodline Bandra, and then yeah, you told us a bit about Four and Twenty, but uh, Bloodline Bandra. Well, well, Bloodline Bandra was was a reaction to what happened to me in New York City. Uh, this was thirty years ago, thirty five years ago, or forty years ago when I migrated to the United States of America. Uh, I was a full-time journalist, uh, and then I decided to work for an Indian newspaper in, in New York City. They offered me a job as a journalist, and uh, I, 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 you know, sponsored me and everything else, and I came there. But what Bloodline Bandra really states is how Indians how Indians, specifically Indians, 
exploit their own kind mercilessly. Now, this this can this is a fact because if you go to places like Kuwait and and I've talked about this often and Dubai, and you see how the workers are are exploited. You know, the poor workers, many of them who come from the south, are treated like animals. They 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 sleep in animal sheds. Uh, they are underpaid. Uh, gross, gross, and all this is done by Indians to other Indians. And I, I couldn't get over the fact that, you know, first I was treated so badly, it, it got to a point where, where I tried to kill myself. I tried to commit suicide. It was that bad, believe me. And then I decided I'm going to write about this in Bloodline Bandra, how Indians specifically trap other Indians. You see, what happens in the United States of America is this, and it's a fact till today that if you come to the United States of America on what is called a work visa, an H-1B visa, you can only work for that employer. You cannot work for anybody else. And in most cases where Indians are concerned, they take advantage of this. And you've got nowhere to go. Uh, in, 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 in Kuwait and stuff like that, they take away their, their passports. You know, and the, the poor guy, can do nothing about it, nothing. And it enrages me and it hurts me that Indians can do this to other Indians. But you know, that, that, that's, that's a fact, you know. A lot of people uh, then said to me, well, you know, you're putting down India because you're, you know, you're an American citizen now. No, 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 that's, that's you know, I was born in Bombay, I was born in India. It's, it's, it's you know, I still, still feel about India regardless of my American citizenship or whatever. And the, uh, it did very well, actually. Bloodline Bandit did very, very well. It, it got the, it was on the top 10 of Oxford books in, in India, published by HarperCollins. And uh, so, you know, I, I was very satisfied with the fact that I could, I, I, could, I could come out and say this, you know, how, what Indians do to other Indians and, and, and there, man, there are horror stories from places like London and New York. How Indians just exploit Indians. Uh, there was some a, a, a big thing on BBC that I don't know how many people have seen, where all these poor guys from Punjab and stuff like that uh, were just exploited, made to made to sleep in uh, in, in in sheds, you know, in gardens. It's just horrible, and all this is done by Indians to Indians. So, so, there is so, no Godfrey, denial. so, Godfrey, so, so, what I'm getting the the feeling is that uh, your your background is of course journalism, and you feel uh, you've seen these issues firsthand, and you're taking them up, but in a form of fiction. So, at what point uh, did you decide to tell your story in in a fictional form format, and how difficult was it? Oh, it was extremely difficult. It was extreme, especially where Bloodline Band was concerned, because uh, uh, you know it brought it brought back a lot of memories. The lead character is somebody called David Cabral, which is part me. You know, it's it's part autobiography, kill, and uh, it 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 brought a lot of unpleasant memories. You know, a lot of unpleasant memories is that I was drinking a lot you know, to dull the pain or whatever. And, but I got through it, you know, I finished the novel uh, and it got published, you know, and it did very well. But once again, I'm, 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 I'm so glad of the fact that, you know, I could say that and, uh, and part one of Bloodline Bandra, and I, I had to do that because I am, I am what they call an East Indian. Uh, I documented Pali village, uh, as to what the culture of the East Indians were, you know, so that's part one of the book. And then this East Indian character called David Cabral goes to New York City, uh, you know, to work and how he gets exploited. But basically, it's my story, man. Uh, unfortunately, it's my story, you know, and uh, the East Indians uh, in Bombay were very happy with the book because, you know, it, it talks about their culture. <coughs> Sorry. 
and how the East Indians are the original inhabitants of Bombay, the Kolis. You know, they were the first ones there. Everybody else is, an, is basically an outsider who came into Bombay. If, uh, and uh, in, Including the Shiv Sena. If the Shiv Sena is also, the Shiv Sainiks would be outsiders too. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Actually, I, 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 I had a big argument with Bal Thakre when I was interviewing him. And he said, you know, you people come here. <laughs> I said, no, 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 no. Just, just listen to me. <laughs> I didn't come here. <laughs> you came here. Uh, I was a very, I was a very close friend of Bal Thakre because of journalism and stuff like that. But he's dead now. <coughs> and uh, yeah, so that was Bloodline Bandra. Interesting, interesting, very interesting. Uh... So, so in that sense, uh, tell us something about your journalistic career in India, the highs and the lows, and why. What made you move out from journalism to fiction in that sense? Well, you know, I, I had I had a really great career in India as a journalist. I started off with some student magazine or something like that. Worked my way. <coughs> Which, Sorry. which which student magazine? Which student magazine? Oh, I don't even remember the name now. I see. Uh, but eventually... Not GS, or GS the Junior Statesman or something like that, no. No, 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 no. no. Eventually, I, I, I got to be the assistant editor of a magazine called Society. Uh, uh, you know, the starters group. Yeah, of course, of course. It was big. Society was big in that sense. And right. So I was noticed. assistant editor, Benoit Thomas, who, who is now in Canada and who I'm in regular touch with, was editor. Uh, <coughs> the previous editor of Society was Shobha Day. Right. She was also the editor of Stardust. Anyway, from Society, I moved to Sunday Magazine that was based in Calcutta. And that's when I started really serious journalism. Uh, but there's one thing I want to tell you about an article we ran, which is very interesting, in Society Magazine about Mother Teresa. She was obviously living there. Then I found out that Lintas International had moved a large sum of money into Mother Teresa's account for tax purposes. Now, uh, th th this was kind of rather sensitive because you can't just accuse somebody of doing that. So the best thing I did was one night I was working late in society. I decided to call up Calcutta, uh, call up Mother Teresa. There was no chance that I could talk to her. Obviously, no chance. It was around 10.30 at night. I just placed a call. I just placed a call from the office. And it rang and somebody picked up the phone and said, I said, you know, is it possible to speak to Mother Teresa? And the voice said, and I nearly died. This is Mother Teresa. Oh my God. <coughs> Talk about a coincidence. And I told her, I just put it to her straight. And uh, she said, well, I don't want this money. I don't want this thousands and thousands of dollars. I said, oh, great. So I went and met her. I went and met her and uh, came back with the story, man. They had they had moved the money. Now, publishing something like this in Society magazine was a problem because of ad support. Lintas, you know, could have stopped all the ads coming into society. They were so powerful. And, you know, there was back and forth between Benoit Thomas and me and Nari Hira, who owned the, owned the, the whole place and owned Society magazine. And they were not going to publish it. They were sure, I'm, I was sure they were not going to publish it. It was a great story. Eventually, to make a really long story short, it got cut down into one page, I think. But they published it. Now, one week later, one week later, there was a small write-up in the Times of India buried away saying that Lintas International had withdrawn this money from Mother Teresa. <laughs> okay.
that was very very interesting and you know talking to mother teresa and meeting her just amazing woman i mean down to a practical you know there's no telling stories where she's concerned you state what you came for and that was that tough woman man tough woman and uh, you know god bless her god bless her she stuck by her gun saying i don't want this money i don't know why they they've given it i knew why they had given it but they withdrew the money so that's one of the good things you know we did in society another good thing we did in society magazine i had gone to cover the bhopal disaster you know 83, the gas disaster 1983 yeah yeah 84. i don't remember when 84 now. 83 or 84 yeah but i was in the middle of that and there was a guy from bandra who i who was dying in the hospital he was going to die now i had i had me and the photographer i think we had plane tickets so i said i've got to get this guy out from here before he dies you know uh, his name was anthony i remember and uh, we wrote about it in society magazine and i i i i i managed to get him on the plane i said you have got to do this he's going to die this guy's from my hometown he's affected by the gas we got him on the plane <coughs> thank god you know so these these are the little things man that that matter to me you know where society was concerned i then moved to sunday magazine uh then the war was on the first the first gulf war and uh, i went to israel to cover the first gulf war so i became a war correspondent and that was a hell of an experience you know because saddam hussein was sending scud missiles into into tel aviv so i covered i covered the war from from israel I came back and after some time i got an offer from india today from arun puri saying you know we've read your stuff and all that kind of thing and uh, would you like to join india today now india today was a big magazine then i don't know what's happened to it now but uh, right, right it was very big it was very big and it was the main main news magazine in the country then right right so i i joined in it today as principal correspondent uh and i was working there when i got a call from new york i can't tell you this guy's name and 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 uh, and the publication because they'll most probably you know they will sue <laughs> uh, but yeah america's a, you know is a very litigious country but uh, that's when i left bombay and flew into new york to work and that's when uh the whole saga began man the really really torturous saga which ended up by me nearly losing my life uh, you know how these indians uh, exploit you you know don't pay you well they don't uh, they just exploit you i was made as soon as after a 16 hour trip from bombay to new york i was made to sleep on the floor in the office that's how it started my career in journalism in new york sleeping on the floor in winter without heat that's how they treat people you see what they do is they get people to come in treat them like animals and then you want to leave or you want to go go they get somebody else and you know it's at that time it's new york city it's the center of the world you want to be there uh, and it's a great city but that's what the indians do many of them many of them and i worked for for all the two two or three major newspapers in in new york city indian newspapers they all the same all the same and for a long time you know and then of course i eventually i left and got another job and whatever it is but i had unfortunately a great hatred for indians for many many years you know and that was really bad really bad because i am an indian in the end my blood is indian you know and thank god i got over it but i will you know i forgot i've forgiven them man but i cannot forget frederick i cannot ever what they did to me like i, I said i nearly jumped underneath a train 
you know, saying this is this is. I have to end this somehow because see, you come here, you don't have the money to go back. You know, I I did not I did not come from a very rich family to start with. You know, we were we were very poor living in Pali village. I didn't have great savings and things like that. You know, I never foreseen what would happen to me like that. And uh, when it did, it's it's and people said, well, why don't you just leave and come back home? You're psychologically so shattered. You know, you're psychologically dead, man. You're going to come back home to what? You know, like a defeated guy. I had no money. I was basically homeless. You know, sleeping in people's houses. I really was. I really was homeless in New York. Godfrey, and wild, wild, wild on this point. Uh, you know, from your earlier writing, I also get the feeling that, uh, like other East Indians, you have this strong sense of, uh, you know, disappointment at the way Bombay has shaped us, shaped up at the way the East Indians have been pushed out of the city, and uh, you know. While they some may have made their money on real estate deals, but by and large the community as such has got dispossessed. Would you agree with that way of putting it, or how do you see it? Well, number one is you're going to get dispossessed because people like me and everybody else, the East Indians, if you, we were talking about the East Indians, have left. They've all gone to Canada, uh, the states, some of them, but mostly Canada, Australia. New Zealand, uh, they've all they've all left. You know, now I'm the last one to talk because I left too. So if I if I if I sit here and tell you, oh, you know, I really great East Indian culture, and well, why did I leave? You know, if so, this cuts both ways, man. You know, there are no great East Indians left in 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 Bandra, in Bombay. They've so all gone. Could history have been different? Could they have uh, treated it differently? See, because these big waves, while they bring prosperity and and prominence to a place, they also bring a certain amount of pushing out. Uh, could could the East Indians have tackled it differently? Could history have been different if if something was done in another way? What do you feel? Well, that's that's uh, Frederick. That's like looking through the rearview mirror. You know, it's 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 happened already. Uh, now. What really, really could have changed the thing is that nobody left and went to the United States and Canada, including myself. Uh, and and you know, if you go to Canada, for example, you go to a place called Brampton, or you go to Mississauga, all you see is Indians, and many, many of them are East Indians. There are Mangalorians there. So basically, a lot of the East Indians just left. So but, there was but, nobody to really hold up the flag. But the other argument is that life becomes tough. So it's it's difficult to hold on. You know, we recently, uh, our, some of our friends published a book called uh, House at 42 Hill Road. That is uh, Brenda and uh, Joe Yeah, I, 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 I heard about that. Yeah, yeah. And, and it tells, it documents the kind of uh, travails that they went through just to stick on there, you know, in that sense. And uh, the impossibility of the situation where, where you know, everything is against you and... Uh, you're fighting against a tide and you can't sustain and you know uh, you're fighting so many battles at the same time so in that sense is there a reason for people leaving their places well let me tell you something about the east indians my friend okay the first thing is property problems okay the house that i was born in the house that i was born in a beautiful bungalow in pali village till today is still under litigation my family I don't own it anymore, and I cannot take names, but my family is still fighting over it. This is a regular occurrence with the East Indians. With all, with all, with all Catholic communities, including in Goa, in that sense. And that's, 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 also, that's also a reflection of the democratization of, of society, where everyone has equal property rights of, of field they do. And, you know, right. I mean, yeah, so. But to, but to answer your question as to, you know, could this tie them? <coughs> have been reversed. The only way it could have been reversed is that the East Indian stayed. You know, you've got to have people there to stand up and fight. Uh, you know, it's it's like it's it's like you know that old story about the Goans. Uh, you know, and the Goans didn't like what I wrote. And so, that's so, why. so 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 let me interrupt you at that stage because that's a whole funny story. 
and uh, I need to background it with a little bit of information. So sometime in, uh, when was it? It was in 2010, when actually one of our common friends, if I'm not mistaken, it was uh, the journalist Hartman D'Souza. Right. Actually, uh, actually, what should I say? Uh, introduced us to you. And you wrote this piece with its very provocative title, which is called A Letter to the Bloody Goans from an East Indian Bugger. Yeah. In brackets, no, Godfrey, Godfrey Pereira. In brackets, Godfrey Pereira. Okay. Right. And, and it caused it was a huge outcry, but the sum and substance of it was simply this, that you are warning, you are warning uh, Goans that if they are not careful, they are going to go the same bloody way, to use, to use a slangish term, that uh, what has happened to the East Indians. And in a way, you know, what happened to Bandra yesterday is happening to, to large parts of Goa today and things like that. Well, I so, was right, right? The point, the point, the point you were making there was, sorry. Hello. Hello. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can hear you. Godfrey, I can hear you. Carry on. Yeah, okay. I can hear you too. So, so what point were you making there? Well, the point I was making is that, you know, instead of complaining and not getting involved, get involved, stop complaining. You know, I know the language was kind of very fierce and but you know i just i just i just put down what 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 i really felt about it and 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 then and the reaction was from all over the world i was getting calls from australia and new zealand and india and god knows where you know and all of them threatening me uh, you know <laughs> one letter said you come to goa and we'll cut you up and put you in a sausage <laughs> i remember that i remember that make sausage out of you but but yeah. some of them also agreed some of them agreed with you didn't they to be fair. They did. They did. Now you, you have to understand. I wrote this after I I, I had I had stayed with Cheryl, uh, Hartman's sister, Cheryl. on a farm in Cheryl. Kepe. Uh, yeah, you know where Kepe fighting, is. She was fighting the mining issue and all that. Yeah, in Kepe. Right. They, man, they tried to kill her and rape her daughter. They said they're going to rape her eleven-year-old daughter. And I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And and there is a press. There is video of a press conference where she's crying. And, and, and asking the Goans for help, you think any, any, not one Goan tried to help her, not one. They tried to run Cheryl off the road and kill her and murder her. I couldn't keep quiet about this, you know. I don't care, yeah. you know. And yeah. so that's one of the reasons I, I wrote this, this piece. Yeah. And uh, all I'm saying is, you know, you can see Goa, which is such a beautiful state. Get involved, you know, get involved. Stop this mining business that's going on. It's killing you. <laughs> okay, so, but, you know, so, sorry, sorry. No, no, I, I, I became, you know, I became the messenger, you know, and they basically tried to kill the messenger. No, I get your point. Case. I get your point. The letter is 11 years old and it's on Goanet. It's in the archives there. I would recommend that anyone who wants to take a look can just uh, look at the URL below. It's a bit of a longish uh, website, web address. But please do and please read it. And I think many of these things are prescient and they kind come before their time and they are an early warning, which we need to be take, which we need to be taking carefully. But uh, but having said that, uh, this guy uh, Godfrey, uh, what what I would like to know is. Uh, from here, where about your two books in particular, uh, why why Bloodline Bandra the name and why Four and Twenty Blackbirds? What does the name tell us? Well, Bloodline Bandra was basically saying, you know, my bloodline comes from Bandra, uh, because, like I said, part one of the book details the East Indian culture. Uh, I had to do that. You know, because there's no, there was no book that really detailed the East Indian culture. There was, uh, later on, there was a book called Kimada, Kimada that came out by Menezes, George Menezes. I, I don't, I don't remember. I don't have a copy, but I was featured in that as a writer or whatever it was. But uh, there was a, a good history of the East Indians there called Kimada or Kimada. Kimada, 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 Viva Kimada or something like that. I'm, I... Right, right, right. Very, very, it's a copy table book, but very, copy very, table. very nice. I forget the author. He lives in Bandra, Menezes, I think. Uh, so that was Bloodline Bandra. Basically, you know, in the end, David Cabral in Bloodline Bandra leaves New York and comes back to, to Pali village. Okay. Uh, 
but that was Bloodline Bandra. But 4 and 20 Blackbirds, uh, basically, is the story about Charlie Strungo, who was born in India, has never seen England. And he decides to open a black market trade with 23 other British people. On, and, and they live on a place called Cross Island. Now, Cross Island, many people in Bombay don't even know that Cross Island exists. But it's right there. If you go to Ferry Wharf, it's 100 meters away. You can see it. That's where it happened. Now, I first heard the story in Croydon, England, when I was, I went to London. This is, God, years ago, years ago. And we were sitting in a bar. And this old guy comes up and, you know, just starts talking. And then when he heard that I was born in Bombay, he started talking about what had happened on Cross Island. And he had these letters with him and he gave me the letters. And they were the letters that Charlie Strongbow wrote. In which year? Oh, my God. This is about... <coughs> 12, 13 years ago, I was visiting my friend Colin and Ramona in Croydon. They're both dead now, unfortunately, you know, my very close friends. And that's when I first heard the story about this English guy who opened a black market trade between Southampton and Bombay. Going to and which years? Going, going back to which years, the black market trade? Uh, this was after Indian independence. After 47, I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. After uh, soon after Indian independence, uh, Interesting. They, they started this black market trade because prohibition was coming in and they made a lot of money. But the book also details how corrupt society in India is and always was and will be. Uh, you know, it wasn't the British that created it. The British came in and built on the structures of corruption. Uh, that's that's what it is. And, and, and another thing, I have to point this out, Frederick, which is very, very important. The great English poet W.H. Auden wrote a poem called Partition. Now, I am a student of English literature, okay? I went to a Catholic school. We which were is? never even which told school? about this great poem. Which school? St. Andrews in Bandra. Bandra, Bandra. Yeah. We were never told about it. We I was not told about it in college. I think that this poem should 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 be should be studied by Indian students because it will give you a background of the partition and what happened. It's a stunning poem. It's called Partition by W. H. Warden. If anybody is listening to me here, anybody on on the show, please please read this poem by W. H. Warden called Partition. It tells you how insane it was. The man who partitioned uh, India had never been to India. You know, the whole disaster of partition. And we, we were never taught this poem. I don't know why this poem is not taught in schools. W. H. Auden is a great English poet. Great English poet. Why not include this in the syllabus of schools? And then you can talk to the students about what happened during partition. It's, it's, it's historical. And Indian students should know this, should know this, must know this. It's part of our history, but it's never taught even at a college level. And it's simple enough for school kids to understand, for high school kids to understand when you're on the ninth or 10th standard or whatever, even the sixth standard. I think they should do it. Some, if anybody is listening to me, if you're a teacher and you're listening to me, Please, please include this poem in your syllabus. Godfrey, uh, maybe one last point, unless there are others. Uh, I spent the last 14 or 15 years of my life trying to set up this small publishing venture in Goa. Right. And uh, which focused on books because we don't have uh, books focusing on the place. And uh, actually, uh, you know, what often struck me is that the East Indian community, which is uh, so accomplished, uh, so well networked, so much into advertising, uh, so much into the big city, doesn't have its own publishing voice. Would you agree with me that someone in Bombay needs to be taking up this goal of, uh, you know, I mean, like Viva Kamada and a few books have come out, 
there there have been some very good books on the east indian community i've got one on east indian food and whatever comes on east india you know i i mean on the east indians i i am looking at it uh, though we are though the goans and the east indians are not genetically connected we are culturally connected and historically connected but unlike the mangalorians we are not genetically connected which is fine but there are so many similarities and so many interesting things so my question is uh, do do you feel that maybe maybe the east indian community need some more organized publishing happening there well you do you do but uh, number one it requires dedication and it requires money uh that's what it requires i i don't know anybody in india besides uh, the, the author of kumeda uh i i really don't know i i've you know, i've lost touch with a lot of india uh, i was supposed to come down to india uh, to market 420 blackbirds but i can't because of the covid business right now so i will be coming maybe the middle of next year but but to coming coming back to your question of course it's possible but it requires dedication and it requires you know now in 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 goa you you know a friend of mine called manohar shetty <coughs> he was there when i met you uh in goa uh i don't remember the name of the place where we met but manohar shetty the poet who used to yeah. live in dona paula he just moved was there he writes about goa a lot you know now people like him I mean it's a, he's a treasure man you know and he's very well respected in in the literary community so so you need people like him you know to do some this. memories some memories about bandra growing up there past the changes oh to... oh oh we had a great time growing up in bandra where you know uh where the film stars at that time people like dilip kumar used to used to you know live up on the hill and you know these people would stand the pali villagers would stand on the junks and just stand and talk or whatever it is while away the time and these these actors on their way home would stop and talk to them so i remember dilip kumar you know talking with the with the with the with the pali village folk and stuff like that and it, it see at that time it was more open you know we we could play out on the streets there were not so many cars uh oh we had a great time i i i had a pretty happy childhood you know 70s early 70s mid 70s we are talking about yeah 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 i was born in 55 so talking about late 60s late 60s and uh, you know there were the all the illegal booze joints in chimbai where everyone would go to drink and some that's another by, by go and aunties also some of them oh yeah 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 the <laughs> and, and, it's, and it's, it's funny the east indians in a way have have a bias towards the goans because I remember in pali village there was one goan family one no everybody else was east indian i see and that family was was referred to as those goans <laughs> <laughs> i don't know why <laughs> I really don't know why. Yeah. What so, is the bias? So so now so in the this, beginning in the beginning in. there was a bias against the goans because as I've said in Bloodline Bandra the goans would come down to Bombay for jobs. And the East Indians really resented the goans because the goans were technically Portuguese citizens. Right. The East Indians were sons of the soil meaning they were on the side of the british so and i don't know how many people you know know this to distinguish the goans from the east from the east from the bombay catholics queen victoria made this distinction calling the east the bombay catholics east indians because of the job situation because the best jobs went to the east indians not the goan because the goans basically were outsiders so in a way there was this divide and rule you know starting right. way back when and yeah then, and then yeah and then you all grew up with magazines like junior statesman and mumbai was still the bombay Bo- mumbai was bombay and bombay was the media capital of india and all that no oh it in was you know it it, it until today i think you know somebody in bombay 
uh, you know, looks at somebody from Gujarat or wherever as a little inferior. It's the same with New Yorkers. You know, New Yorkers, <laughs> yeah, they think they're the cat's whiskers if you're a New Yorker. It's the same thing, man. It's the same thing, right. a bias against for nothing. Right. You know, uh, like, but, but like, Bombay, like Bombay, Bombay was really the media capital of India in those days. Still, Delhi oh, kind was. of nudged it, nudged it aside. Not many years back, and you know, it was a place where the, I mean, Bollywood was happening, and our thoughts were shaped, and everything came from Bombay in those days. Oh, you know, we we, we lived right up there. I, I I remember sitting at the house of Devan, and you know, we we would just walk in. I'm not kidding. We just walk in. Uh, just amazing times and you know he he knew us obviously because you know of the interviews and things like that and sit and drink with these guys and whatever and uh, rajesh khanna was another guy now the, the editors of stardust and there was another magazine called showtime and we've all worked on the same floor so one day we were drinking at my place in in bandra in pali village and he just says to me Let's go to Devanand's place. I was like, are you kidding? No, so we got into his car and drove to Devanand's place. In Bandra. And continued drinking there. In Bandra? Yeah, in Bandra. Devanand lived on Pali Hill. So, you know, there was a lot of power, you know, being a journalist at that time. And, yeah. uh, and you know, I enjoyed it. I mean, there's no, there's no doubt about it. And, you know, I had a decent career in, in Bombay as a journalist. You know. So how do people get your book, 4 and 20 Blackbirds? Uh, it's going to be well, out 4 and 20 Bombay. Blackbirds will be available in, yeah, in bookstores in India by the 12th of December. And uh, uh, online again on the 12th on Amazon, anybody in the world can buy it. So uh, they, once again, the Indians might not be very happy uh, with some of the things that are said in 4 and 20 Blackbirds, but it's history, you know. It's history, and Come you know on, you read it. Be said. It needs to be said, probably also, but yeah, yeah. You know, let people read it and decide. You know, it's right. it's gonna be out there now, uh, and uh, that's about that. We'll see where it. You know, what happens. Thank you. Thank um, you so much. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. You know, controversy somehow has always followed me, but but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Including, including with your with your letter to bloody go and friends, from yeah, a band I know. I, I that was fun. that was fun. That was really fun, and we enjoyed every moment of it because, uh, you know, people were getting hot under the collar and all that. But oh my I, god, hot! I mean, <laughs> setting to kill me all the time. I like but the one. I like best was to make sausages of you. I don't know if they would be very tasty <laughs> or not. But that was a good. <laughs> Anyway, no, no, but, what what are we recording for? Is it a radio show? It's it's actually a YouTube video, which is uh, like you know uh, going live at this moment. But I'll also oh, replay yeah. it later on. Uh, thanks a ton for all your time and for for sharing all this uh, information with us. I'll oh, do my best. I'll do my best to pass around the video and make sure that uh, those who aren't here with us get a chance to see it at a later stage. Godfrey, thanks a ton. Uh, your and, base, and, uh, yeah, Frederick, I, I have told the publicity people in Bombay to send you, they will be calling you to send you a copy of the novel so that you can write about it. Thank okay? you. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. All books are welcome. I really love books. I never seem to have enough of them. I think that's greed. But anyway, thank you so much. Thanks for your time, Godfrey. All the very best. Looking forward yeah, to your exactly. book and looking forward to its release. Thanks for time. Can you, can you send me the link to this? To this Definitely. Uh, Definitely. Yeah, I'll just email it. me the link. I'll do it in two minutes. Bye. Thank you so much, Frederick. Thank you. Thank God you. bless. It's great seeing you after so many years. Thank you. I think the number of years looks longer because in the past two years, I've lost a lot of hair and grown a lot white. So people say, <laughs> even who've seen me two years back, say, we've seen you after long. Bye. Bye, Godfrey. Bye. See you. All right.